Hello, Monetization Nation. Whether we like it or not, the government laws and regulations can massively affect the way we operate or cannot operate our businesses. Sometimes we need to advocate to make sure these laws and regulations are affecting us and our customers and our industries in positive ways. As we advocate or do anything in life, conflicts of interest may arise. In today's episode, we're going to discuss what Marion Mass is doing to improve the healthcare system through advocacy, how we as entrepreneurs can be better advocates within our industries, and how we can remove our conflicts of interest to improve our credibility. Tectonic shifts are constantly transforming the earth and business, causing destruction and huge growth opportunities. I'm Nathan Gwilliam, the host of Monetization Nation, where we learn how to leverage business tectonic shifts to transform monetization. Marion is a mother, a pediatrician, a community volunteer, a writer, and an advocate to ensure high quality, sustainable healthcare in America that will attract bright, hardworking minds in the future. She's a Duke and Northwestern trained practicing physician in the Philly Burbs. She co-founded the nonpartisan grassroots Practicing Physicians of America and serves as part of the leadership of the Free to Care Coalition. She speaks, writes, and advocates about improving healthcare access and lowering its costs. On today's episode, she's going to share what she's doing to improve the healthcare system and how we as CEOs and entrepreneurs can be better advocates within our industries. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Marion. Oh, Nathan, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Okay, so first, I want to talk about the robe. You're wearing a bathrobe with rubber duckies on it. And I know in your bio, it talks about how you proudly work in a robe and did that long before COVID. Maybe tell us the story behind the bathrobe. (laughs) The story behind the bathrobe. Well, first of all, it's got rubber ducks on it. It it teaches me to not take myself too seriously, right? Uh, So here's the story. Uh, My kids were, two. the older two kids were in junior high. It was nine degrees outside on a January day here in Pennsylvania. And they came running in and said to me, the bus isn't here. We're really cold. Can you take us to school? I said, okay, I'll go up and get changed. And they're like, no, no, we're going to be late. They're freaking out like, you know, teenagers always do. So I just like ran out to the car. I had, I had like literally bedroom slippers and the robe. So as I got to school, I noticed that my car is like on a whisper of fuel So then I drove to our convenience store, the Wawa. That's what we got here in Philly. And um, I noticed that my purse was not in the car because my husband took the purse out to use the checkbook the night before. And my purse also contained my cell phone. So now I have to go into Wawa in the bathrobe, right? Mm -hmm. And like the woman behind the counter doesn't even flinch that I'm in a robe. (laughs) And so she lets me call my husband. And as soon as I told him where I was and he, you know, he's from Florida, he knows what it's like to be outside nine degrees and not like it. So he came screaming over and he uh, had to pump my gas and he was wearing his robe too. So at that point I decided, you know what? And I'm, I'm often caught in these like phases where I'm like so busy and I'm writing and then I have to go on an errand and I just like, don't even have time to change. I'm like the hell with it. I'll just go and I'll, I'll go buy milk in my robe. I'll go like over to see my friend in my robe. No one cares. Who cares? I mean, you know, this is, it, and it's really yeah. comfortable. And by the way, the story happened years ago, long before COVID, this whole business about the pajamas and, you know, being in your pajamas and being in your robe and, you know, working on zoom. Ah, I've been at that for years. <laughs> it's really comfy. Uh, tell us something that you're super passionate about. I look upon healthcare and I think to myself, I loved my, my journey through medical school and residency, and I love taking care of patients. I woke up one day and thought to myself, um, you know, my, my kids are getting a little bit older. And I looked at the landscape of medicine and I thought, what the heck happened here? And who's going to choose this for a profession in the future? And there's a lot said that the applications are up to medical school, et cetera. And I, I, I'm not doubting that. I've never seen the numbers, but I think overall, I see a lot of physicians um, going through what I call Drexit, doctor exit. They're frustrated. There's, there's way too much box checking that they have to do on the mandated EHR. There's way too many little mundane tasks that they have to perform, you know, prior authorizations, like jumping through hoops for everyone, the government, the boards, Medicare, Medicaid, 
the insurance companies, the PBMs, you know, you, there, there's so much that we have to do. Physicians, either they get burned out or they get morally injured or something. You know, people are leaving, they're going to industry. People are retiring early. People are, are worst of all, doctors are committing suicide. We have one of the highest professional suicide rates in the nation. We're losing the equivalent of a medical school class every single year here in America. It's really shameful. And I think to myself, this is what we have. I'm a gardener. So I think in terms of gardening uh, terms, we have a non-sustainable profession right now. It's not sustainable. And if we don't fix it, America will be, I think, very unhealthy and sorry in the future when they show up to deliver their baby or have their appendix taken out and there's not a quality physician there that's well-trained to take care of them. And it's, it's not just unsustainable from the doctor's point of view and, and attracting new doctors. It's also unsustainable from the cost of healthcare perspective. You know, I, I would guess that most of America can't even afford you know, health healthcare without the insurance. And, and a lot of America doesn't even have the insurance to get the health care that they need. I've, I've seen this firsthand. I, I've lived in a socialist country and I'm not advocating socialist medicine, but um, I've lived in Brazil a lot. And Brazil has, has a socialist medicine system that doesn't work um, and it's horrible. You walk in there and it's just, the joke is, or what people say is, those are the hospitals where you go to die. And, and then they have a secondary, almost a shadow healthcare system that is outside. So, so the government pays for healthcare for everyone, but then the people that want good healthcare, they go pay for their own healthcare and, and they go use the shadow healthcare system that's not provided by the government. And it's crazy inexpensive. It is so cheap because they don't have to go through any of the hoops of the insurance. They don't have to go through any of the hoops of the government. They just provide medical care. They don't have to charge an arm and a leg. And, and it actually is some pretty good care. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. And I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just sharing what I've, what I've seen in my experience with a different healthcare system. Well, if you won't, I will. <laughs> so uh, I have a friend of mine right before the pandemic, her mother needed uh, a hysterectomy in the Ukraine. And this friend of mine is from the Ukraine and it's a socialized system over there with another tier. So she went to the government run hospital and found out they had no soap, no hand sanitizer and no toilet paper. She had mm -hmm. to bring her. That's what it's like. So actually she said for a really not expensive fee, she moved her mother to the just pay cash hospital, got good care and just sort of felt like she wasn't going to die for an overwhelm from an overwhelming infection. Yeah. I mean, do the doctors have soap? <laughs> like who knows? But in any yeah. case, um, you're right. You touched upon something. Healthcare has consumed costs all across the board. So who's paying more? Public sectors are paying more, like school districts. Pub, uh, employers are paying more because our healthcare insurance is tied to costs. And really, I don't even like to call it, or I shouldn't call it healthcare insurance because it's not insurance. It's simply a very expensive third party middleman whether yeah. it, it one of the BUCAs, which is the word I say for Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna, and Humana, or it's Medicare and Medicaid. They are large, obstructive middlemen. And I'm not advocating that we get rid of the government-assisted healthcare, but pst, news to all Americans, Medicare Advantage is run by those big insurance companies. So is Medicaid. All the pharmacy benefits in Medicare, they're run by the PBMs that are now tied to the big insurance companies. So you may think you're getting like government, lick the government take over, but it just means that those big insurance companies are the ones that are going to run everything. They're obstructive and they're costly. So what percentage, you know, I think it's up to, you know, we say 20% of our GDP is now getting tied up by healthcare. But if you really take the numbers apart, um, I'm so lucky to like say he's my friend. You know, we text once in a while, we talk occasionally, but Dr. Marty McCary, a professor from um, Hopkins, a transplant surgeon, has written an amazing book on the cost of healthcare called The Price We Pay. 
And he did a really incredible USA Today article, who I think it was about a year and a half ago. And like what he did was he broke down all the numbers. So if you take out, um, you know, what we're paying in taxes for Medicare taxes and, you know, portions that we're paying for uh, Medi uh, Medicare Advantage insurance and portions that we're paying out of pocket, you know, our, uh, our uh, co-pays, our the things that we pay at the pharmacy counter, all the rest of that stuff, we're actually really spending more like half of half of all of America, America's money is just running into healthcare. And it's incredibly wasteful because there's a lot of people at the top. I call them the paper pushers, the bean counters. It's, it's these very expensive middlemen that are like, they're siphoning out your pocket. And shockingly, they have little to do with the actual laying on of hands. You know, we say in medicine, like, we've got to see you, we've got to hear you, we've got to put our hands on you to help heal you. And it's not just us, bedside nurses, physical therapists, respiratory therapists. If you take the healthcare dollar, you take all of those people, all of those people that lay their hands on you to heal you, they are making 25 cents on the healthcare dollar. Everything else, 75 cent, this giant red Pac-Man that's chewing up the 25%. Physicians make 7.4 cents on the healthcare dollar. Wow. Okay, so we've got this big problem. We, we have created a system that is too bureaucratic for doctors. It's very hard for doctors to do their job. We're losing a lot of doctors. And we've created a system that's way, too, way more expensive than it needs to be. Um, you've been involved in a whole bunch of advocacy to help solve this problem. Can you tell us a little bit more about your advocacy efforts to try to solve these healthcare problems? Sure. So when I finally woke up from like the fog of, you know, <laughs> med school residency, having children, getting them to age four, getting through the potty training, I like woke up one day and I'm like, what a mess, what happened? And so then I decided like, uh, I need to start to get involved. So I started looking for groups that were going and talking to people that I thought made the rules. So one of my first trips to Washington DC was in uh, 2015. I mean, I had already started to ask questions before that, maybe back 29, 2010. But in 2015, I made my first trip to Washington DC and I tell people about this all the time. So I go into the office of a, a congressperson and I was thinking to myself, oh gosh, these guys are going to be so well-versed. They're going to know everything that I'm talking about, everything that I've learned over the past couple of years. I'm nervous. You know, you know, my, my hands are a little bit sweaty. I'm like thinking like, am I going to catch in my voice? All that other stuff. My response when the conversation was over was, oh, oh, I should have been doing this a long time ago. And so I tell people all the time, if I can do this and look, I'm in a robe, you know, please, I'm, I'm a, a recovering soccer mom with an MD, you know, I'm a real person. I, I will have conversations now with lawmakers while I'm in my bathrobe sweeping my kitchen because I do all my own stuff myself. But if I can do this, anyone can. So I've begun writing. I serve on the editorial board of my county newspaper here in Bucks County, um, I've begun speaking. I do a lot of podcasts. I've done, uh, I've run two events at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., nonpartisan events, bringing together physicians from around the country from multiple specialties, uh, talking to lawmakers from across the aisle. Um, if I can do this, anyone can. And the most, the most satisfying thing for me, it actually happened today again, uh, uh, Dr. Farina Khan. She's um, a U.S. citizen. She trained in Pakistan for medical school. She published a great piece. Uh, it was in 14 Pennsylvania newspapers. Um, I, you know, I told her, you know, you've got a great voice. I, I had actually had her connected to someone who did a different podcast and she was on the podcast and she was talking about how there's not enough residency slots in the United States. There's more med school graduates than residents. I mean, the fact that she published this piece, it's like flinging all over my Twitter now. And I you know, put it up on Facebook and I need to add it to LinkedIn later. But the fact that like, she felt like, oh yeah, I can write. And I hope in part it's because I told her, Hey, Farina, if I can do this, you can do it. So I think like finding, finding your voice with, with speaking, with writing, with speaking to people that can change policy at the state level, at the national level, at the community level, that's so important. I mean, it, 
we look, we train to do this. We're the ones that close the door and hear people's intimate stories. And it like, it breaks my heart when people can't get what they need. I can't tolerate it anymore. Okay. So, so obviously the healthcare advocacy work you're doing is very important to the entrepreneurs and CEOs who are listening to the show Um, because Healthcare is one of our biggest costs, number one. And, and number two, making sure we're taking great care of our people is, is really important. Um, so, so first of all, thank you for the, for the great work you're doing. Um, oh my. It's helping all of us and, and our businesses and our teams. Uh, secondly, within each of our organizations, uh, we all deal with legislative issues that affect us. And sometimes those legislative issues cause a lot of problems for the businesses of the entrepreneurs and CEOs who watch this show. Uh, for example, um, over the, the past 10 years, there's, there have been some adoption laws that have been passed that have been horrific or some, some rules and regulations that have been passed that are, are, are just abominable and have, have resulted in a lot fewer children being able to find loving permanent families. And, and as a lot of my listeners know and watchers know, I, I work with adoption.com and I spent, you know, almost two and a half decades now working with adoption. And so adoption is something that's very close to my heart. So because of these anti-adoption laws and regulations that have been um, pushed through, um, I've had to get a lot more involved over the last decade in advocacy in, within my niche of adoption and working with senators and congressmen and, and government uh, organizations and, and associations to try to get bad laws changed and, and try to prevent more bad laws from being created. And, and even to try to, to get one bureaucrat, bureaucrat who's anti-adoption removed from, from her position. Um, and uh, and it was amazing the the people that came together to try to impact that change within my industry. So you've done something interesting that helps build your credibility. A lot of people who lobby and advocate uh, things in DC have conflicts of interest, and those conflicts of interest um, take a, take away from the credibility of what they're trying to do, and and their opponents attack those conflicts of interest. Um, in, in your business, or sorry, in your advocacy efforts, you've done something interesting to help remove that conflict of interest and improve your credibility. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. And it makes me kind of a bad financial entrepreneur. Um, I, I don't take speaking fees. I don't take writing fees. I, I've actually been offered, but I, I don't take them. I, I've never taken a dime to speak or to write. Um, I don't, are you familiar with the Physician Sunshine database? I'm not. Yeah. So, oh my goodness, was it about 29, 10, 11, somewhere around there? Um, there was a database that was formed so that you as a citizen could go look up every physician in America and see how much money they took from the pharma or the device industry. And, you know, it makes sense that we should have it. I'm not saying we shouldn't have the Sunshine Database, but uh, essentially, if someone says to you, you need to take medication X and you go find out that they're taking a couple million dollars from the pharmaceutical company that manufactures X, you're going to be a little suspicious. Do I need medication X or do I not? Right. Okay. So it, it's a good thing that we have this database. Um, every pen that we take, every uh, drug lunch that we go on, it's part of the debate database. So if you look me up, you'll find that I am, um, I think it's something like 28 or $34 worth of stuff taken over the past couple of years. I, I don't go to that many drug lunches anymore. Uh, there's physicians on there with the average take is 3,400. There's people with $5 million worth in take on there. And, you know, that's great. I think it also applies to other things. I know physicians that give lectures. I know physicians that give lectures on just what we're talking about, the cost of healthcare, the physicians that give lectures on burnout, physicians that give lectures on all kinds of things. They take speaking fees. And I'm not saying that 
I suppose it's fine if they choose that they're going to take the speaking fees. But I think as soon as you get paid by someone, a university, a hospital, an insurance company, Lord knows who, what, as soon as you open up your mouth to take a speaking fee, then doesn't it kind of make it sort of the suspect the same way that a doctor would be suspect by taking fees from pharma? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's um, uh, think tanks, same thing. And happening across the aisle, I might add, there's a group called the Brookings Institution. If you start paying attention to the Brookings Institution, it looks to me like there's a lot of insurance money flying into the Brookings Institution. And they're starting to have discussions about surprise medical billing, which, uh, you know, uh, surprise medical billing is really the result of us having networks that the insurance companies artificially created. So you have the insurance companies paying off the think tanks that are writing in newspapers about the problem that the insurance companies created in the first place. Mm-hmm. And then everyone reads those and they think, oh, this must be the way we do it. This genius at the think tank wrote this. And I'm like, what do you mean genius? <laughs> it looks like a bean counter to me. <laughs> Terrible for me to say, sorry. But mm-hmm. I, I think the fact that I don't take speaking fees and I know others like me that don't, I think that means something. I mean, yeah. maybe we should have a database where our speaking fees are right up front and personal. And by the way, our stock options and our conflicts of interest, yeah. you know, all of that should be up there. I love that. And in business today, credibility marketing is one of the biggest tectonic shifts that entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and CEOs are dealing with. And we have to find much more credible ways to communicate with our customers and potential customers. And, and conflicts of interest is a a powerful issue related to credibility marketing, because as customers perceive we have a conflict of interest, they our trust declines. Uh, for example, if you go to a chiropractor and the chiropractor recommends supplements for you to take, right, and the chiropractor sells them and makes money off of them, regardless of how honest or ethical that chiropractor is, it's just human nature that we ask the question of, okay, he has a conflict of interest, can I trust this? And, and we as business owners need to, to work to remove those conflicts of interest, like you did by getting rid of your speaking fees and your other con- conflicts of interest related to your advocacy. And as we do that, we can increase our credibility. Thank you so much, Marianne, for sharing your stories and insights with us today. Here's some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, anyone can advocate. We don't need any special qualifications. We just need to care about the issues and have a desire to make a difference. Number two, when we advocate, we should work together with many other people who share our passion for the issue. Number three, there are many issues that affect our businesses that may require us to advocate for our industry, our customers, and our businesses. Number four, if we remove our conflicts of interest and communicate that effectively, we will improve our credibility. If you enjoyed this interview and want to learn more about Marion or connect with her, you can find her on LinkedIn or visit Practicing Physicians of America. And there's links to both of those websites in the blog post for this episode at monetizationnation.com. Do you want to be a better digital monetizer? Then please follow these channels to receive free digital monetization content. Number one, you can subscribe to the free Monetization e-magazine at monetizationnation.com. Number two, you can subscribe to the Monetization Nation podcast or YouTube channel. Number three, please follow Monetization Nation on Instagram and Twitter. Have you been involved in advocacy? If so, how has it affected your business? Please join our private Monetization Nation Facebook group and share your insights with other digital monetizers. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I wish you success in your advocacy efforts. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.